got to run back with the intern or make an in off. That would be the better term. The intern side that you want to tap around that rock in the eight foot to stop on the button. More rotation and more spin and action. Kom får vi se något vi inte får se så ofta. Then the second rock will get an out turn. That's real close. What's he got here? Hitting the rock a little bit thicker and higher. Titta! Titta vilken sten! Oh! Unbelievable! Någonting liknande. Har du sett någonting liknande? That is the absolute craziest shot I have ever seen. Well, thank you very much, Nick, for coming in to McLaren's Pool Hall here in uh, in Ottawa. I, I really appreciate you coming for the uh, for the pool hall because it's so much like curling. Yeah, I really love uh, both games actually, and uh, uh, I find them both very challenging. Uh, maybe later on now, I find pool more challenging. Obviously, I'm better at curling, and then making way more mistakes in, in pool. So I, I just like that game to challenge myself more nowadays. Yeah, you get so good at curling, but how'd you start? Let's talk, let's talk about getting going. Where'd you grow up? What town, where were you at? I'm from uh, Örnsköldsvik in uh, Sweden. It's on the east coast, but it's pretty far north. Uh, grew up on a farm also, uh, a bit outside the city. So uh, lots of sports, lots of running in the woods. So it was a very active lifestyle growing up. Were you able to curl as part of the activity or did your dad curl, your mom curl? Like... No, none of them had actually uh, tried curling at all. My mom, she knew about curling a little bit. She's from a city where curling is bigger. Uh, so then watching it at the uh, 98 Olympics, I was uh, 13. And then watching it there, I'd never heard of it before. Uh, and then she was like, uh, you don't want to try? Mm, doesn't look too much fun. I was into a, a lot of other sports and then she phoned some uh, some of my friends from the soccer team uh, and then just pointed it out to me like okay we're heading to the ice rink uh, they're gonna try curling and i'm gonna drive them so do you want to come or not and i was like you did what <laughs> <laughs> okay i guess i have no choice then so four of us from the soccer team uh, went to the curling rink tried it and we all thought it was amazing it was so much tougher than it looked and so much more of a challenge in a sport than we thought it would uh, be after watching it on TV so we were hooked uh, right away. So the four <laughs> the four <laughs> soccer players, unless I miss something, the four soccer players, mm -hmm. you became a team? Yep. Oh. <laughs> okay. And, yeah, so we started for, for the first like three years we had that same team and, uh, and went through um, the younger junior stages and, and then started eventually playing in like the uh, the, the league play, um, still very low level. We weren't any good still, uh, but we were talented, I would say, uh, being in, into a lot of other sports and physically uh, like at a very good level for curling. But it took us a few years until we actually got good at it. So when did you start playing pool, Nick? When did you start? Uh, when did you probably learn? 10, 12 years ago. I've been around pool tables and I really like watching pool. I just like the theoretical part of it, like kind of like curling, I guess. Yeah, cool. You won the World Junior, I think in 04, is that right? Yeah. So, so you didn't even try it until after 98. <laughs> so this is a tight frame here. Yep. So where and there would you have known, huh, uh, you know what, I, I'm going to go this direction. Uh, I felt it pretty much right away that it was a sport that just suited me, I guess, that I, I felt like I uh, came fairly naturally to me and I kind of saw what I needed to do and how to get the rock in, into a different position, uh, maybe a little bit quicker than some of the other members that had played for much longer. So I just felt like this... This to me seems pretty obvious, but it doesn't seem to be obvious to everyone else here. Um, and they were also big in, in, uh, in math and physics in school and we're all kind of similar minds, I guess. So we kind of picked it up quickly at the theoretical level, but then to become a good team in curling, there's so much more. And that was basically at the age of 16, I guess, only having played a couple of years, but we moved down to um, a different city to, to start the curling academy and that's when it really took off. 
The first time I noticed you, like where I noticed, like, ooh, this guy's getting good, was in Vancouver, 2010 Olympics. Um, how big was that for you to be able, because you made the playoffs there and, and, and had a really good event, I thought. Yeah, and I think we went into that event as the last ranked team, actually, we, and we had just won the Europeans to qualify, so we were uh, one of the last teams to actually qualify and one of the last teams to actually get an Olympic spot from the Olympic Committee. It, it all like came about pretty quickly there. We, we switched team from that junior team to the team I had in that Olympics. That was a year and a half before the Olympics. So after 2010 then, Nick, like, I guess where, where did it happen where you weren't quite consistent enough, you weren't quite good enough, but where did you make the change? Where did you see the change where all of a sudden, oh, wow, we're here? Yeah, I think a lot of it had to do with confidence. Um, we were a fairly young team still, or a very young team at that level, uh, so we weren't high enough on the rankings, we weren't consistently getting into the slams, we had just started like, reaching that level where we could play the top teams in the world. I think the first nine slams we played, we qualified in all of them. So we were kind of consistent enough to, to, to be close to that top 10 kind of uh, range, but, but when we really took the next step was maybe a year or two after that Olympics. Uh, when we kind of felt that now we we might actually be the team to beat part of the year, but w again, we needed more experience to really be the top name going into the next Olympics. What'd you do here, Kev? Should I chalk up? <laughs> well, I shouldn't chalk up just yet. <laughs> Good shot. I remember talking to you when you were young, and you were coming over to, to Canada at least six weeks a year maybe even eight, um, and playing events and, and practicing. Um, I guess the importance of that, I want to get into maybe your, the business of curling mind a little bit here, um, because that, that was a, that's a major amount of time spending away from home. Yeah, it certainly was. We, we uh, kind of right away knew that if, if we want to do this, we, we want to get to the top. And, and how do we get there? Then we have to spend a lot of time uh, and effort and in the beginning money as well. It took us several years of full-time curling before we broke even. So we, we, uh, we sacrificed a lot in the beginning. No one had done that before us, at least not in Europe. We were very determined that we want to do this full-time if we can. So. Uh, if, if in the beginning we need to um, spend some money to get to an event, then we need to do well enough to win prize money to pay for the next event. And that's how it rolled on the first few years uh, before we kind of got Olympic funding and we got expenses covered. And then we were in the system. It was a lot easier, obviously, then to at least know that we, if we have a bad season, we'll, we'll be broke and we, <laughs> we have to quit. <laughs> so, so that kind of scare was a little bit off the table after that, but it, it took us a long time to get to that stage. In the beginning, it was, uh, it was risky, but we, we were uh, determined to at least give it a shot. That's a tough way to, uh, to make, to, no, that's a lot of pressure. It was, a, it was a lot like that, actually. We played lots, but they were smaller event of, uh, events, but it, it was kind of enough to build a bankroll to at least be able to go to the bigger events. And then uh, after that, the Olympic Committee kind of saw like, oh, this team is uh, doing everything they can and they, they are very consistent at what they do. So maybe, um, maybe we want to take them into the program a little bit and then uh, got to Canada, um, one, one of the first trips that was in 05, I think. Um, so we got one trip paid for and that really opened it up for us. Like, whoa, like curling in Canada is massive. So <laughs> we, that's where we need to be. Uh, like we've watched a lot of curling from the Briar, like old VHS tapes and stuff, but being in Canada in, in like a, a 16 sheet rink or something like that, or being in Winnipeg, seeing all the curling clubs and stuff, was just like mind blowing how, how massive the sport is over here. So that, that really took us uh, like mentally to the next stage where we need to go to Canada. That's that's kind of the plan now, and get some uh, some better knowledge uh, in in general, and just get to the next level where it gets more complicated. So what do I do here? I don't really have a shot. Okay, so you don't have a shot. Yeah. Kind of like sometimes in curling, mm -hmm. but then it's what you leave. Yeah. And that's exactly what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that's the easy ball to make. So as long as I kind of end up with this guy being in the way and lots of distance, then you don't really have a shot either. What sacrifices would you have to make to, to be able to come to Canada for weeks on end with no funds? 
Yeah, in the beginning it was, it was actually really tricky. Obviously coming over to North America to curl, uh, it takes a lot more travel days and you're, you're constantly tired and, and like obviously it's expensive too. So we needed to basically find all the time and money we could just to, just to be able to do it. There was never a question of getting a salary uh, in, in the beginning. We, we had no money to go to savings or anything. I remember at one point I had to phone my mom after a few years doing full-time curling. I phoned my mom and I was like, I'm broke. <laughs> so can I borrow some money? And, and and I ended up being able to pay them back pretty quickly, but, but I was at a stage where I didn't really have enough to pay my bills anymore. So it was like, mm, this is getting a little bit too risky. And we were, we were getting some, some free food by, by a sponsor that kind of gave us uh, frozen packages of food. So we brought them to the ice rink and microwaved them uh, during practice so we could practice like four or five hours a day. And then choosing the, the cheaper um, like options, always stayed at motels or at a friend's house or something like that. Never, never hotels, never expensive uh, anything really. After a while when we started coming over more and it turned into 150 days a year in Canada, then obviously it has to be more convenient. You have to kind of choose more expensive options to just feel that you, you, you have the time to perform in a more quality type of way. Wow, <laughs> that's a great story. I had no idea about all that. You're in Canada 150 days a year. In the beginning, obviously, it was just uh, one or two events, and then we started getting more and more into uh, Canadian curling, and, and like the knowledge and the tradition was so much deeper than in in European curling, so many more top teams. And even if you just went to like a smaller local spiel, it was still really high quality. You had some teams that could beat you that you'd never heard of. And, and that turned into 150 days a year pretty quickly, I would say, after getting the results. We had to get the results and had to get the, the funding to cover expenses to be able to go over. But as soon as we got that, we were in Canada yeah, 150 days a year. And, the travels went up to over 200 days a year for, for quite a few years, but then we were coming kind of into the 2014 Olympics and, and <coughs> leading up to the 18 Olympics. Then those years we had a lot of travel days, like um, between 200, and the most extreme was 250 for me. It's not getting any easier though with no. those balls where they are. <laughs> oh, nice shot, very nice six-time world champion. Each of the medals in the Olympics, you've got a gold, a silver, and a bronze, four-time Grand Slam champion. Um, arguably the biggest name in our sport. You know, everybody thinks, you know, Nick and Nicholas Dean is bound to be a millionaire. Uh, has to be. How does the system work in Sweden for, for a curling team? Yeah, it, it has been tricky uh, over the years. And, and like for us, uh, we're kind of in a, very small sport in Sweden, it's nothing like it, it is in Canada. And then uh, obviously we've been very um, bound to um, having that Olympic Committee funding. Um, so they, they are basically more of a sponsor, they cover expenses and then uh, when you're in their programs you can use their physiotherapists and, and doctors and nutritionists and, and whatever uh, people you, you ca can get some help from. Um, but that gives you help, it doesn't really give you a salary. Uh, so to have a salary, we, uh, the system that is put in place now is basically the, the winnings we get on tour, uh, along with sponsorship, with, which would be very, very, almost insignificant uh, for, for our team in the last few years. Uh, but the winnings, that, that would be like the, the only salary we have basically. Um, so that goes into the Curling Association, our employer, Swedish Curling, uh, and then they pay out a monthly salary. Uh, and then the tricky part to that is that it, it can't exceed a certain amount per year to still get ke or keep the funding from the Olympic Committee. Uh, so that would be covering expenses, that would be uh, $170,000, $180,000 a year uh, as a budget to cover expenses. So that would be travel, accommodation, entry fees and, and a per diem for food when we're away. Uh, so, so they would cover all of that, and that without that we couldn't survive. Like we, we could not do this full time without that support from the Olympic Committee. Your injury, let's get into that this, this year a little bit, um, because it, it happened in the end of October. Um, and the amazing part, uh, which is really hard to imagine, is that uh, your team. How I guess how did they manage to get through all of that with with your injury? But they kept winning. 
Yeah, obviously, I, I like we, we started very young, obviously, and and then the team like we, we had to work on a lot of things to get to the level we are at now. But I think in, as of the last few years, we've really seen like our team on all four positions uh, are extremely strong. Uh, looking at both the numbers and and the knowledge of the game and how to uh, sweep correctly, read angles, all of that, all four are very at a very high level compared to any team, any position uh, in the world right now. But still, one player short, one sweeper, different roles obviously was not going to be easy. But they, they started right off the bat by winning events and like not just doing well, but, but winning events against the um, strongest teams in the world. So uh, yeah, su super impressive. I think uh, super good for our team to having done that. I think it was extremely good for the confidence um, because now like uh, me coming back as a skip then we go back to the, the the standard roles again but we have confidence maybe at a higher level throughout the lineup this one you might have that spin shot to make it kind of go that way oh yeah. <laughs> what we so, talked about earlier so over to okay so what yeah. you're saying is this has to have uh out turn, yeah. Counterclockwise. Yeah, so that one in turn, out turn, <laughs> and then go a little bit to. Yeah, well. You know, isn't that funny? You get on a curling sheet, that doesn't even hurt my brain. No. Nope. This hurts my brain. <laughs> so let's see, an in turn. So I've got to hit it this side. Ooh, that is one nasty leave. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what gets you motivated? What, what, what keeps the, the fire burning still? Uh, first of all, I, I love sports. Uh, always have, always will. Uh, so, so being in sports, be, having an active lifestyle, doing lots of training, uh, watching sports and, and, and being kind of impressed by people doing sports and performing well in sports, how they, how they work, how they approach uh, things, how they um, think about it, like how they problem solve, uh, if you will. So, so just like being around sports in general, that, that is always going to be a massive part of me uh, as a person. Uh, and then curling, obviously, that's the one I'm, I'm good at. So uh, I like doing that and I, I, I like the, the way that curling is uh, kind of set up where it's a, a physical aspect to it, but it's also a big theoretical and mental uh, part of curling. Uh, the, the older I get, the more mental um, uh, I, I need to uh, look at it, I guess. And, and the physical side, I can't be as strong or as fast as, or as fit as I used to when I was 20, 25. But um, I'm, I'm trying to stay in good enough shape so that it doesn't become an issue. Uh, and then now I'm just trying to improve my mental and theoretical game all the time. And, and, and that keeps me going. Oh, very nice. Yeah, that's... I throw in the towel. <laughs> Very nice shooting. <laughs> Very nice shooting.